Hi there, my name is Daniel Brace and I'm an i2 support engineer with the i2 team here in the UK. Uh, today I'll be taking you through some of the new features which we have added to i2 Analyst Notebook version 921 in conjunction with i2 Analyze 431 and its EIA counterpart 231. Today we'll be having a look specifically at the new geolocation features which have been added to i2 Analyst Notebook. So to start with, let's have a look at how we get open the new i2 Maps pane. As you can see over here, the i2 Maps pane is currently open, but this probably won't be the case when you first open up Analyst Notebook. So to do this, you need to make sure that you go underneath the Analyze tab and click on the Maps button. Now this will open up a different pane depending on what your map provider is set to. So you need to make sure that you've clicked i2 Maps as the map provider if you want this one to be open. As you can see, if I click the Maps button now, it will collapse the pane, and if I click it again, it will open it up. So let's have a look at some of the items which I've placed on the chart surface. This chart surface is schema aligned to my information store, which means that these address entities are aligned to my information store schema and also have the information and property types which they inherit from that. Let's pick 10 Bulldog Way. So if we have a look at that, we see over in the record inspector that we have everything we sort of expect to see from previous releases, building number, street name, zip and postcode. What's new for this release is the geographic location option, which allows you to enter in a latitude and longitude, which will then appear in this little preview window here. The latitude and longitude are the important bits of information which allow the mapping software to locate where this item is going to sit on a chart surface. As you can see, you can also zoom in and out of the little preview window which appears for each record. If I were to select all of my records and go through the record inspector, you can see that the little preview changes for each record which I'm picking. Another important feature to note at this release is that the latitude and longitude might not be something that you're familiar with using. So we've also included the ability to convert from different supported coordinate types into the version which we need to use in order to map the data properly. So say for example you're used to using the OSGB 1936 British National Grid Ordnance Survey coordinate values of Eastings and Northings. If you place those in here and then click convert it will automatically turn them into the appropriate latitude and longitude versions and then be able to place them onto the chart surface. So let's now have a look at how we place this information onto the i2 map surface. So the i2 map surface can be added to by simply right clicking one of your geographic location entities and saying add to map. This will then zoom the map in to the place where you have selected this place to be and add it to the map right away. You can do this not only with a single item, but if I select all of the rest of these items and then right click and say add to map, They'll all be added, and then the map surface is zoomed out to show as many of them as possible. As you'll also see, um, it's not possible due to the close proximity of two of these items to show them a, a relative view. So what i2 Maps has done here is it has clustered them together under this two. This shows you that um, there are actually more than one property underneath here which we'll be able to have a look at. And if I click on them, it'll highlight the two on the chart surface. The same thing happens if I click onto an item which I can see and it will select that one on the chart surface. And this works in the inverse manner as you'd expect as well. If I select Temple Dock Way, that one is then zoomed into onto the chart surface. So let's select all of my items again and it will zoom me out to the appropriate location. One important thing to note as well is if I zoom out from the map here, slowly the clusters will start to clump together. Now, one useful thing that the mapping software can do for you as well is if you hover over this you'll see that there's a light blue sort of square which is being highlighted here. This is probably more prominent if I zoom out a little bit more. You can see we get this kind of boundary shape. What this is showing us is the outermost entities which are on the map surface and therefore where roughly all the rest of the entities are going to live. Again we can just simply click on this and it will select everything within there and we can slowly zoom in and then the clusters will split themselves apart. The last thing to show you is how to remove markers from the map surface. You can do this very simply. All you need to do is select the item which you no longer wish to see on the map surface, right click it and say remove. Or alternatively, if you'd like to remove all of the information from your map surface, you can use the remove all markers button. Now let's have a look at the visual query geospatial condition which we've added at this release. If you click on the visual query button, 
and then click the new query button, add an address for your query structure and press OK. You'll find that one of the entity types that I have for address has the property type value of geographic location and I can use this in my condition. To define my area, I simply need to click the edit area button here. This then allows me to use certain tools to define the area I want to make a search in. Say for example I wanted to search across the United Kingdom to find or anything in my information store that matched that area. I could use the rectangle tool and roughly draw a rectangle across the United Kingdom and press OK. I could then press run and all of the results are then returned. Now let's go back and edit the query for a different area using a different tool. The first thing you need to be able to do is to delete this. So first of all, let's delete all of the items off of my map. Now I'm going to use the polygon tool to be a little bit more specific. To do this, you simply click to start your drawing, highlight the areas which you want to search in, and once you are done, you simply need to click the first point again in order to finish off your polygon. Again, you can press OK and press Run to test how your query performs. Note with polygons, if I delete these ones off again, what I can't do, and you'll cause an error to occur if you attempt to do so, is intersect your polygons so that they run over each other. So if I do this, and then press OK, you'll see that an error appears that says a query condition contains a geospatial value that includes an invalid polygon. Only use simple closed polygon shapes. Let's go back in and delete that shape now. You'll also may have noticed that there's also a GeoJSON button at the top right hand corner here. So let's once again draw a simple polygon around the United Kingdom. But before we click OK this time, I'm going to click on the GeoJSON button. As you can see, this shows me a GeoJSON representation of the points that I just drew, which I could then share with my colleagues if I wanted them to repeat the same search. However, this is a two-way street. Say I want to be much more specific than I've been with my simple polygon. I can enter some supported GeoJSON into this text box here, such as this one, which I've saved earlier for finding information in Washington, DC. I'll copy it into my clipboard, paste it, into the GeoJSON section, and you'll now note that when I press the map button, it converts that GeoJSON into a polygon, which is much more specific than the one I created earlier. If I then press OK, once again, I can run my query, and it'll return me any results which match the geospatial condition. That's all that I have for this video. Thanks for taking the time to watch, and we hope this helps you.